are your works, and that my soul knows very well. So God's creative genius, and uh, it's amazing to me because, you know, the very inner, <clears throat> my most inner being knows that very well. And so when, um, when Dr. Thomas Kendall comes up here, he's going to share some things that give us practical insights to the work of God that we would know even better, that you can't see with your naked eye. We can see the stars, but you can't see what's in that microscope. And he's going to show us some things that would just add to that incredible understanding, you know, practical uh, insights to, uh, to God's amazing, miraculous, ingenious creation that we all understand just didn't come together coincidentally, but by a creator. Amen. So, so welcome. Uh, Welcome, Dr. Thomas Kendall, please. Okay, well, thank you, Pastor Anthony. I appreciate that, and I, I think everybody will be very happy if they look through that microscope. If we can go ahead and get the presentation up, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> voice is a little <coughs> hoarse from all the um, teaching I did yesterday, but I think we'll get through this all right. I've got my faith and my handy dandy lozenges as well. So, <laughs> okay, hopefully this thing will work. Sometimes I might have to say next slide, please, like the old days, but you'll know what it's all about. Yeah. Next, yes, next, next. <laughs> Okay, well today we're going to be looking at, if I can get this thing turned on, that helps. We're going to be looking at biomimetics. Biomimetics means copying design found in the world of biology. So bio in the Greek means life and mimetics refers to mimicry or copying. And we're going to find that biomimetics means that God invented it first. There are two basic forms of biomimicry. Uh, one of them is uh, inadvertent, where we being made in the image of God, having intelligence, having uh, the ability to see a problem and think it through and design an engineering solution, you know, in technology to meet that need, we have invented a lot of things. But what we have found in more recent times is that a lot of things we thought we invented, we in innovated, we are the creator of it, didn't exist until we made it. But that's not true. In many cases, God thought of it first, created it from the beginning of creation. Until we started looking in the world of biology, we didn't realize how much God had beaten us to the punch in creating all kinds of amazing designs and creating it in a way that's more efficient, more effective than what we had tried to re-engineer with our own God-given intelligence. So he not only did it first, he did it better in most cases than we can even copy when we deliberately try to copy it Often we only get a percentage increase in our technology. It's very difficult to match the percentage of efficiency that we see in God's original designs. But the more pure form of biomimicry or biomimetics is to deliberately look at the world of biology, which a lot of scientists and engineers are doing today, to see the amazing design there and to see where we can apply it in our own technology uh, to do things better than what we have currently or to actually do things we never thought we could do before because we see how it operates in God's amazing world of biology. So we'll be looking at both of those types of biomimicry today. And remember that God gets the glory. He is the originator, he is the patent holder, and he should be given the glory for it. Now, armor <coughs> is something that uh, probably was invented not long after the fall of man, when men began to organize and have armies and fight one another. But uh, you know, man uh, has had this probably since biblical times. Certainly the ancient Greeks and Romans had it. It's interesting to me that on the breastplate, they always put that six pack on there. You know, it's like, <laughs> I've got to cover up my six pack, but I want you to know it looks like this on the inside, so <laughs> be afraid. <laughs> well, armor is an ancient invention, but God thought of it first. He created certain armored dinosaurs, like the Ankylosaurus, and also the armadillo which in uh, Spanish is pronounced armadillo. It was named by the Spanish, and it literally means little armored thing. So God invented it first. Even a full suit of armor, which we did not invent until the Middle Ages, is not something that we invented first. God beat us to the punch with the box turtle. Talk about a full suit of armor, there you've got it. 
and the Elizabethan Man of War. It was traditional to name ships after women with female names, but when they decided to put a lot of cannon on a ship, they thought, well, we don't want a, a feminine name. That sounds a little too weak. We want it to call it a Man of War. And so they put all those guns on it and they christened it the Man of War. But even a sail ship that is formidably armed is not something man thought of first. God thought of it first and created it first. We call it the Portuguese man of war, okay? This is not a jellyfish. It does not undulate under the water to propel itself. It has this inflatable sail. So it literally is a sail ship. And it is formidably armed, not with cannon, but with these long tentacles that typically can extend 30 to 35 feet down from it. I think the record <coughs> is uh, 150 feet, they found in one case. So they have neurotoxin in them and just touching it releases that neurotoxin which paralyzes fish and then it is drawn up by the tentacles into the mouth of the Portuguese man of war and digested by enzymes. So the first one to think of a sail ship and a formidably armed sail ship was not man, but God. Now, even something like the diving bell, man thought, oh, we, we invented this idea to have you know, a way to dive down on sunken treasure. And prior to the invention of the diving bell, it was very inefficient. You had to have uh, divers that could dive up to 100 feet or more holding their breath, stick as much treasure in a basket to be pulled up to the ship as they could, but then they had to swim all the way back to the surface, catch their breath, then go all the way back down. So all that time, was very inefficient going up and down, up and down, catch your breath. When they invented the diving bell, of course, you could go right into the diving bell, right next to where the treasure is, catch your breath, load up the basket, catch your breath, load up the basket, much more efficient. But even this is not something man thought of and invented first. God invented it first with the amazing, what's it called? The diving bell spider. In fact, the diving bell spider has hairs on its abdomen that it mixes with some of its spider silk and makes a very effective trap for a big bubble. And so God not only invented the diving bell first, he also invented the aqua lung, or in other words, the scuba tank. Now, arachnids like this and insects breathe through pores in their exoskeleton. They don't have a regular lung system like we have, but as long as those pores are exposed to air, they can breathe. So this can free dive with an aqua lung or a uh, scuba tank, but it also takes its silk and builds its own little diving bell. It scrapes that, those bubbles off its abdomen to fill up the diving bell. And ounce for ounce, spider silk is many times stronger than steel. So it makes a very effective diving bell and it'll sit there, breathe through its pores, and if it sees any prey going by, it free dives out to get it. God, again, he invented it first. Now then, Honeybees, amazing creatures. I have a whole DVD just on honeybees, one of the most amazing creatures God ever made. But one thing that's fascinating is their honeycomb. It was demonstrated, I believe, by a Greek mathematician back in the third century that the hexagonal shape of the honeycomb, especially the angles that are used and everything, can be proven mathematically to be the most efficient uh, storage system where you get uh, the greatest storage with the least expenditure of material, but also the greatest strength possible. Better than squares, better than circles, better than rectangles. The hexagonal design is mathematically and geometrically optimum. So uh, just 2.2 pounds of honeycomb can hold 50 pounds of honey. And it's just wax, you know, it's not like steel or something, it's just wax. And because of this, because it represents an optimal design where you get the greatest strength with the least expenditure of material and uh, therefore the least expense to produce it, you, you want you know, the strength to weight ratio is what you're looking for. It has applications in every place where you need lightweight but also great strength. And it's been copied from ancient times. For example, the ancient Romans copied the design in this. Anybody know this building in Rome? The name of it? It's called the Pantheon. Pan meaning all and Theon referring to gods. It was a temple to honor all the Roman gods. And as you can see from the size of the people in front, it is quite large. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world because it had a big freestanding dome, which is not easy to do. Uh, <clears throat> if you're working in pure concrete and things like that, it could easily collapse under its own weight. But we found that on the inside, it has this kind of uh, embossed squares 
running around it, and it has a skylight. Romans were one of the first to figure out how to use a skylight. They called it an oculus, which means an eye, but it provides good uh, light during daylight hours to that huge building. But on the inside, we found when they did renovations that the inside structure of the dome is actually made of a honeycomb design because the Romans realized we've got to have lightweight, but we've got to have strength, and if we're going to make this you know, wonder of the world, this big freestanding dome, we don't want it to collapse under its own weight. So they copied from ancient times the design that God innovated with the honeycomb. And we use it today in the 21st century, uh, usually on hidden parts of the car, because you want a car to be light, but also strong. If it's light, it doesn't burn as much fuel, it's more fuel efficient, can go faster, but you also want to have that strength that you need. And this is on a BMW, and it's even used in the military. Here we have a new 40 millimeter grenade launcher. And this was all put together, believe it or not, by 3D printing. And yes, they can heat up metal, metal alloy, alloys like uh, steel alloy for the trigger guard and the trigger, and also uh, aluminum alloys for the launching tube, and of course, the polymer or plastic. So it was all printed out 3D printing, but notice what they did on the handle to keep it lightweight but strong. They used the honeycomb design. Now, in aerospace, the honeycomb design has been used for a long time. Again, you want lightweight for airplanes. Extra pounds is not what you want. You want to have range. You want to have, be able to reach altitude. So in the fuselage, in the wings, and the control surfaces, vertical and horizontal stabilizers, the honeycomb design is used on the inside. Even the space shuttle used it. But the honeycomb does transfer sound very efficiently. So they've learned in, in more recent times to put a kind of a buffer in the middle there. It's what you see in the upper left-hand corner. That buffer reduces the sound, and nowadays you'll notice on the newest planes that have this design, they're much quieter than they used to be. So from ancient times with the Pantheon to the 21st century with our automobiles and uh, military and our aerospace industry, we still copy an optimum design that's so good that it really cannot be improved on in any practical way. So as the old adage goes, if you can't beat them, join them. And we have been joining God and his design using it to this day, and indeed for thousands of years. Now then, even the wasps use this hexagonal design. The wasps harvest wood fiber, they masticate it or chew it and mix it with special proteins in their saliva that act like a kind of a biological super glue and makes this very, very tough. I don't know if you've seen old wasp nests that have been lying around in the woods for years, they don't deteriorate nearly as fast as our wood does because that special biological superglue tends to hold it together much longer than our wood paper does. But bees have uh, glands on the bottom of their abdomen that actually produce wax. They don't have to harvest wax from somewhere. They produce it, harvest it off their body, and build their wax honeycombs that way. Wasps don't do that. They harvest wood fiber chew it up and make the same strong design for their wasp nests. In fact, uh, centuries ago, the French entomologist René Antoine Remur, an entomologist is a scientist who studies insects, he said this, he said, the American wasps form very fine paper. They teach us that paper can be made from the fibers of plants without the use of rags and linens. Prior to that, it was linen or cotton was used, you know, to make uh, cloth and used to make paper. In fact, our currency, our paper money today is not made out of wood fiber, it's made out of a mixture of linen and cotton because it's more durable. But for practical purposes and for economical purposes, wood fiber is much, much more practical to use in everyday use of paper. The wasps were doing it from the beginning of creation. And Rene Antoine Remuer said, hey, maybe we ought to copy this. They, maybe they have a good idea there. And today, almost all paper that's used for paper purposes is of the wasp design, using wood fiber, because God thought of it first, but we figured we need to copy that. It's a good idea. Now, antifreeze is certainly something man thought, well, we invented that, you know. That's something we thought of. We are geniuses. We invented antifreeze. But no, God beat us to the punch on even that. Yeah, we see that in a number of different uh, insects and animals, a couple of notable ones, the eastern box turtle and the wood frog. And these live in very cold areas where terrible sub-freezing temperatures in the winter, they should freeze to death, but they go into a kind of a state of suspended animation. They actually look like they're dead. Their heart even stops beating. But the problem, <coughs> excuse me, the problem is that 
if ice forms crystals in the cells, ice crystals have sharp edges, and those sharp, sharp edges will pierce the cell membranes and, of course, cause death. But if you could keep the crystals from forming by having antifreeze in the blood system, in the tissue system, then you can experience sub-freezing temperatures and survive until the spring. It's an amazing thing. It's almost a type and shadow of death and resurrection. They know somehow that they should excrete this biological uh, antifreeze composed of glucose sugar mixed with a cocktail of uh, anti-cryogenic proteins that then saturates in their uh, circulatory system into their tissues. They burrow under the ground, but they don't go very deep. They only have about one inch of earth above them, not enough to get them below where the freezing temperatures would reach them. And if you dig them out in the middle of winter, you'd think they're dead. They're, they're cold, colder than ice. They appear to have rigor mortis like they're dead. Their heart is not even beating. You think, oh, this thing is dead as a doornail. But it's gone into a state of dormancy that mimics death. And because of the amazing antifreeze that God created, they don't get crystals formed in their tissues or in their blood. So there's a, some kind of a feedback system that senses the temperature. And when the temperature gets right in the spring, it kickstarts that heart, the heart starts beating, and they resurrect seemingly from the dead. God who can raise the dead gives us a type and shadow of that every winter with creatures like this, only because he invented antifreeze first, otherwise it would not work. Now, deer hunters would do just about anything to bike a deer, it seems, including the ignoble fate of rubbing deer urine upon their bodies. And uh, this is based on the idea that if you smell like something you're not, uh, deer will be attracted to you, bucks will be attracted to you. If you smell like a, a female deer in estrus, they might say, oh, well, it smells like there's a female here, you know, and uh, actually it's a hunter. So smelling like something you're not in order to gain an advantage over your opponent is not something man thought of first. God thought of it first. And an interesting example is with this particular moth. It's called the death's head moth. That's because it has what looks like a skull with a couple of eye sockets right there on its back. Now the death's head moth is able to infiltrate into a beehive with impunity without being stung, stung to death by the soldier bees. How does it do that? Well, it gets close to the beehive and it whiffs in the specific hive specific pheromone. Each hive has its own scent or pheromone that is emitted by the hive. And if a bee by accident comes from a nearby hive and tries to get into the wrong hive because he doesn't smell right, the soldier bees at the uh, entrance will kick him out. If he keeps trying to get in, they'll just sting him, sting him to death. So it's very important to smell right if you want to get into a beehive. But God made this amazing creature with the ability to get close, to breathe in that pheromone, and then it can produce a very, very close replica counterfeit cocktail that mimics that pheromone so good the bees can't even tell the difference. Very hive-specific pheromone. So then it exudes that pheromone and it comes at night. Now, bees can't see that good at night, but they can still smell. And so when it comes up to the guard bees, they go, well, fella, you don't look too good, but you smell like you belong here, so we're gonna let you pass. <laughs> and so the death's head moth creeps in, siphons off some honey, and then he has to get out pretty quick because although he does produce a replica pheromone, it doesn't last all that long. So he's got to get in and get out before it wears off because if he gets caught, you know, not smelling right, it could be big trouble. But the point is, God invented it and thought of it first before man ever did. Here we have a uh, blank screen. There we are. The Namibian beetle that lives in the Namibian desert in Western Africa, very dry desert. But because it's near the coast, you get blowing in, uh, you know, two or three times a week or so, fog blowing in off the coast. And that fog has quite a bit of water in it, but then it usually dissipates as the sun gets up and it gets hot, it doesn't turn into clouds, it rarely turns into rain, that's why it's a desert. But these beetles thrive in one of the most uh, waterless deserts in the world. And the reason is because God endowed them with an amazing ability to distill water out of fog. And it's done with this design on its back here. It has these bumps. And on the top of those bumps, there are proteins that are designed to attract water. They're hydrophilic, which means they love water and water attracts them and beads up on them. But in the gutters in between these bumps, there are, uh, you know, kind of a waxy type of uh, substance that is water repellent. So it beads up on the top where it's hydrophilic goes into the gutters where it's hydrophobic, it sheds water, 
it tilts its rear end up as it's sitting on the top of a sand dune and the fog is blowing in off the ocean and it just accumulates all these beads of water that slough off into these canals and flow downhill by gravity right into its mouth. If you've ever seen it on television, it's really kind of cool. Well, it turns out this is more efficient than any water gathering system we ever invented for getting water out of fog. We do have such systems. Uh, they're usually fog nets like this, and they're designed that the fibers of the net will cause the fog to condense on them, and then the droplets will come down by gravity into a container. But analysis showed that God's design is 10 times more effective than our best fog nets. So they've decided, well, if you can't beat them, join them. We're gonna copy God's design. And now we have something like a little spike like this because it has the Namibian beetle design. You can stick that out overnight and have a pretty good amount of drinkable water in the morning because it condenses the moisture out of the atmosphere more efficiently than any design we had ever come up with ourselves. And this means that certain places like the Namibian desert or other deserts where it is a desert, but it's next to the ocean, where you do regularly get fog rolling in, uh, areas that were uninhabit uninhabitable because of lack of water, you could now have thriving cities. You just have the roofs and the sides of the houses made with this Namibian beetle design, and then troughs, you know, that siphon it off into a water reservoir, and everybody would have plenty of water because God thought of it first. And now, this could be very helpful because you know wars might be fought in the future over sources of fresh water because fresh water is becoming more and more scarce. Now, anybody know what this beautiful flower is? The lotus flower. And under microscopic examination, we've figured out how it's able to self-clean itself. It doesn't have to use detergents or scrub itself down. When it rains, the water beads up. As it rolls off, it picks up particles of dirt and just sloughs it right off, self-cleaning. The key to that is these microscopic pinnacles on the surface of the flower. And those pinnacles cause the water not to flatten out, but to ball up. And when it's balled up like that, it gets a certain mass and then it rolls. And as it rolls, it picks up dirt with it and it rolls right off. So it's self-cleaning. So a company that named themselves Lotusan Paints, named after the lotus flower, found out a way to make paint that when it dried, produced these kind of microscopic pinnacles. And they're saying if you paint your house with this, you'll never have to wash your house again because every time it rains, and if you're in an area where it doesn't rain very often, you just spray it down with a hose and it self-cleans. This even has application for automobiles. If they come out with paint like this on automobiles, you never have to go to the car wash. I suppose if you have invested in a car wash, you might not like this. <laughs> but other people would probably think, that's great, you know. If it rains, my car gets cleaned. If it doesn't rain, I just spray it with a hose. Don't have to use detergent. Don't have to scrub it down. Self-cleaning. Where'd the idea come from? God invented it first. Okay. Now, what about the taser? You know, oh, well, we invented this. A way to disarm assailants without having to kill them. We just stun them with electricity. Well, God thought of it first, didn't he? Anybody guess who it was? The electric eel. Electric eel is capable of producing a powerful electrical discharge up to 830 uh, volts, and it can stun creatures as large as crocodiles, sometimes even kill them. So uh, the idea of using a powerful electrical discharge to subdue your opponent is not something man thought of first. God invented it first. We only reinvented it with the taser. And here we have the firefly, which technically is not a fly, it's a beetle, but it uses a uh, biological means of producing cold, efficient light. It's known as bioluminescence. And it's based on an oxidative process where it uses the complex enzyme luciferase and the complex biochemical compound luciferin. The oxidative reaction that takes place between them produces this bright light. So here again, that's, you know, that's kind of a cool idea. Mix some chemicals and you get this very efficient cold light. So back in the 60s, Bell Laboratories thought, well, we think we can copy that. Well, not exactly, because uh, luciferin and luciferase, these biochemical compounds, are very complex, as is the norm in life. Not simple, very complex. They thought maybe we can get something easier, so they figured they'd use uh, hydrogen peroxide and some other chemical. I can't remember which one they came up with, but it was economically feasible to do that. You know, the mistake they made, though, when they came out with what we well known today, glow sticks, copying this technology God thought of first, uh, they forgot to patent it, or didn't think that they would need to, 
Now you can go down to the Dollar Tree and for $1.25 get a packet of these from China and Bell Laboratories doesn't get one cent. So a little economic lesson there about you should patent this. If you're going to copy God's design, you might as well get some profit out of it. Uh, but of course, God, God did it better. You know, we break these things and they have a container in there that when you break it, the chemicals mix together. And then it'll give off continuous light by this oxidative process for a number of hours. But the firefly knows how to turn it off and turn it on. It can actually single a mate and signal other fireflies. Once we get it going, we don't know how to stop it. Turn it off and on. God has a superior design there. But there's other superior technology the firefly has that we only recently realized under microscopic examination. They realized that the cuticle on the end of the firefly, where this light comes out from, that the light was very bright and they couldn't figure out how it could be that bright because it's brighter than what we get with our light bulbs. Well, the problem with our light bulbs is that there's always some reflection back. It can't get through the surface without having about at least a 5% partial reflection backwards. So you only get about 95% of efficiency instead of 100% of that brightness. But they found with the Firefly under microscopic examination, there were little grooves in it that are nanometric, measured in nanometers, billionths of a meter. And the grooves were just the right width to be exactly the same length of the particular wavelength of light emitted by the Firefly. And that allowed it to pass through without this reflective problem, making it much more efficient. So they figure now we can take our light bulbs and using lasers to etch these little grooves in there to match the wavelength of our technology with the electric bulbs and we'll have a 5% savings. 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but it adds up a whole lot over time. 5% savings get the same brightness using 5% less electrical energy. You're again copying God's superior technology to improve our own technology. Now here we have the humpback whale and humpback whales are known for not being fast swimmers, they're not like a marlin or a dolphin, you know, they swim very fast. Those creatures have smooth curved fins, you'll notice, if they're very fast swimmers. But the uh, humpback whale is more of a lazy swimmer, he doesn't really go very fast. But at slower velocity, the water passing over these huge fins that it has is more efficient if the leading edge of the fin has these bumps, these kind of almost serrations or bumps, they're called tubercles. Somebody realized, hey, that's just not a mutation, that's, that's not a freak of nature, that is a design uh, you know, trait, it's, it's, it's something that has purpose. So they thought, well, if we have a case where we have propeller blades and we make the leading edge have you know, these bumps and channels on them, we might get more efficiency out of, for example, our wind generators. So they went ahead and tried that, put those uh, bumps on there like we have on the whale, and they immediately got a 32% increase in efficiency. The upstart of that is that these wind generators used to have to have at least 17 miles an hour wind velocity to produce sufficient uh, output of electricity. Now, because they can rotate with less drag, therefore rotate faster in a smaller uh, velocity of wind, you can at just 10 miles an hour get the same energy production as what it used to in the old design require 17 miles per hour which is actually pretty fast wind velocity. So it opens up a lot of areas for uh, windmills and uh, wind generators where they have prevailing winds, but they're of lower velocity than could be used before by copying the superior design that God put there. They also tried this on large industrial ceiling fans and they found an immediate 25% increase in efficiency because of the less drag, they get 25% uh, uh, you know, more movement with the, the less drag and much more efficiency on their energy bill. This also has applications in other areas. Uh, for example, if I can get this to work, here we have the Emma Maersk, uh, used to be the largest cargo ship in the world. It may still be, as far as I know, but it's been a number of years now. But next to it on the left there, you can see, I think it's a uh, Navy frigate and it's just dwarfed by the size of this thing. This thing is so huge, it's about 200 feet longer than a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier. So it is very, very huge. And in the old days, they put multiple uh, screws or propellers on large ships. For example, the Titanic had three propellers, Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth had four. But in modern times, they've realized that one very large propeller that turns slowly because of its mass is actually more efficient in producing uh, the thrust that they need with the least expenditure of energy and therefore more economical. 
So this particular huge ship doesn't have four screws like the Queen Mary. It has one very large propeller. And if you can see that man on the left side there with a white hard hat on, that gives you a scale. It's more than 30 feet across. In other words, uh, 10 yards. If this guy was to throw a football to a fellow worker on the other side, he'd get a first down. So this thing is as high as a three-story house. So it's very, very big. And we find that to be more efficient, but we can make it even more efficient now by putting those turbocoils on the leading edge. That allows at slow speeds, greater flow, hydrodynamic flow, greater efficiency. So it has applications there and especially has applications to the military. I predicted that the military would probably cash in on this. And I recently saw a show where in fact they're doing just that by putting those tubercles or serrated edges on the leading edge of the submarine propellers, they can get greater efficiency at lower speeds. Now, in a submarine, your main enemy is sound. The enemy is searching for you with sonar, and if you get any cavitation, bubbles produced by the propeller spinning in the water, those implosion of those cavitation bubbles is very distinctive, and they can track you on sonar. So they have to go very slow. But by changing this design, the copy gauze design, they can turn even slower and be even more stealthy than they ever were before, at the same time being more efficient. So God's design has been co-adopted for wind generators, fans, for propellers, underwater propellers that turn slow, and also for our drones. You know, drones aren't made to be speed demons, they just have to have a long time on station. You know, they fly around, look for terrorists or whatever, and they want to stay up for as long as they can before they have to come back. Well, by putting that serrated edge on the leading part of the fuselage and on the wings, they find that because these fly slow, it is more efficient, thus less fuel is used and a greater flight endurance is obtained. Again, by copying God's superior design that he thought of first. Now here we have uh, sharks and basking sharks in particular, get the name basking sharks, they like to bask, they don't swim fast at all. And fast swimming fish, you know, like, like marlin and, and even uh, uh, marine mammals like dolphins that swim fast, the velocity of the water going over their skin rapidly rips off colonies of bacteria that are trying to infest them. But slow uh, swimming fish like the basking shark, uh, that's not possible. The bacteria will cling to it, except they found out they don't. And they realized well, there's gotta be something going on here. How can it do that? So they looked at it microscopically and they realized the unique design of this shark scales. It has these indentations in it and they decided if we copy that, we can repel colonies of bacteria. They can't attach. They, they just, it's not able to stick with a design like this. So they're now doing that in hospitals, on door handles, on bed handles, on the sides, any place that you would ordinarily touch, utensils and things, so that you don't get staph infections and other infections, which is very common in a hospital. You know, you're more likely to die of a staph infection in a hospital than you are to die in an automobile accident. So being able to physically repel the bacteria is even better than trying to disinfect it because it just doesn't attach in the first place. It doesn't spread. Where did we get this idea? Not because we thought of it, invented it. God invented it first. We merely copy it. Now glass is something that I'm sure that man thought he invented. You know, glass goes back to ancient times. Uh, the Romans and the Greeks had glass, but they hadn't perfected the correct recipe to make it so that it's clear as crystal. Glass back then was always kind of opaque, kind of foggy. That's why Paul, when he was writing in his day, we see now as through a glass darkly. Everybody understood what he, he was saying, because back then, clear glass that we take for granted, <laughs> nobody had clear glass. It was always like looking through a fog, difficult to see. But God was the first one to invent glass, not man. He was the first one to invent clear glass, not man. We didn't figure out the recipe for that until about the time of the Renaissance. And uh, also, God was the first one to not only invent glass, but to invent glass houses. We eventually came up with that idea. Interesting concept, you know, if you live out in a rural area, there's nobody around, you know, living in a glass house can be kind of nice. You do have a bunch of curtains there, as you can see, so you can pull curtains if you need privacy. But if there's nobody around, you can open it up, have the ultimate panoramic view, and at night you can look through the ceiling and see the beautiful stars in the heavens if you want to. Wonderful concept of a glass house. But man was not the first one to create glass or clear glass or glass houses. Man also did not create this first, and by that I mean glass uh, artistry, 
This is a starfish that's made out of glass, and it's a beautiful work of art. But even this is not something man thought of first. God thought of inventing beautiful works of glass artistry with the glass greenhouses that are produced by single-celled algae. These are called zooplankton. They exist by the trillions in our oceans and lakes, and they provide 20 to 25% of the oxygen that we have today by photosynthesis. Single-celled creatures that extract out of the water silica, the main component in glass, and produce their own beautiful glass greenhouses. Yeah, and they look you know, like fantastic works of art. Uh, the one on the left was made by man, the one on the right was made by God. In my opinion, the one on the right is much more beautiful. So these are called diatoms, single-celled algae. If you were to take a quart jar and skim off a quart of water off the surface of the ocean, you would likely have up to a million of these diatoms in there. You can't see them. They're invisible to the unaided eye. We didn't even know they existed until about 400 years ago when they finally invented microscopes that could uh, see at this level. You have to have pretty much, uh, to see them really well, about 100 power. And the early microscopes only had about 30 power. I think Galileo's was 30 power. You could see them with that, but not very well. But this whole realm of beauty and artistry and architecture, you know, what is it there for? You don't need it for survival. A simple cube, like that glass house that man made, that would work fine for survival value. Why is there this seeming overkill with just beautiful color, symmetry, geometry, and just variety? Well, it's because God is not just the great engineer who makes things survivable. He has an artistic flair. He has an appreciation of aestheticism. He uh, loves beauty. And because we're made in the image of God, guess what? We love beauty too. We don't need it for survival value, but it feeds our soul. It gives us delight in our hearts and minds and soul. And God is the same way. And these hidden treasures of these amazing diatoms have been there for thousands of years, but only within the last 400 years have we been able to see them. And I have some of those back there under the microscope so you can see them firsthand before you leave. In addition, we find they have curving structures, not just geometric structures, and we especially see this in another form of single-celled life that exists in water. These are called zooplankton because they're animals that eat food in the water. They don't photosynthesize from the sun like the algae do, but <clears throat> they're called the radiolaria, and they make glass houses also. They don't have quite the color that the diatoms have, but they have really fascinating, beautiful, amazing design. Uh, it's just you know, intriguing. And here we have some that were done by the famous scientist and artist, Ernst Haeckel. And these are ones that were dredged up on the bottom of the ocean. These don't appear to live today, but because their houses are made out of glass, they last, they don't rot. And they dredge them up and they're just fascinating. You know, the one in the upper uh, left-hand corner there looks almost like a hot air balloon. And the one next to it, like maybe a bird beater. And the one in the middle, kind of like a chandelier. And the ones in the middle look like little miniature gazebos. I mean, it's just fascinating. Uh, one thing they sure don't look like is a bunch of blind, random, destructive mutations gave the blueprint to make these beautiful works of art, which the evolutionists believe. Uh, here we have ones that are so beautiful, they would not look out of place on, you know, the fanciest Christmas tree you could ever think of. If you put beautiful crystal uh, decorations of this type on the Christmas tree, everybody would say, where did you get those? Whoa, those are just fantastic. I want some for my tree. And what if you said, well, the glass factory down the street, you know, they had an explosion recently, and uh, the explosion kind of randomly reprogrammed the computer database and kind of scrambled up uh, the blueprints, you know, for producing these ornaments. And so these superior ornaments came up afterwards when we plugged in the computer all by accident. Nobody would believe that, but the evolutionists tell us that. It's just, it's just crazy, you know. In life, we know something Darwin did not know. Life is based on two things that never in our scientific experience ever arise by naturalistic, unintelligent processes. One is information, which we have by gobs in the DNA of living creatures. Meaningful information that can be read by robotic machines. Not only read and understood, those robotic machines can take that information, take the building components, and put together all the structures of life, including the ability of these single-celled creatures with their DNA and their robotic machinery to produce these beautiful glass houses that look like the finest 
architecture and artwork. I don't think random accidents ever produce information. They never produce machines. Only intelligent design does that. And the evolutionists claim that it can happen, but they have no observational proof. I can say, look, I'll go into the laboratory any day of the week. I'll prove that intelligent design can produce meaningful information. I'll prove that intelligent design can produce complex machines. Where is your proof that we can observe, because science is based on observation and repetition, the scientific method, where is your proof that it can be done? Oh, well, if you have millions of years, well, okay, you're in, in other words, you're saying we can't see it, we can't demonstrate it, you just have to, by blind faith, believe that it will happen with time. But time is not the panacea. Time you can't cause things to happen that are impossible. You can't say, well, water will spontaneously run uphill if we give it a billion years. No, because there's a law that doesn't change with time that says it can't. And the laws of chemistry and physics and mathematics say no matter how much time you have, you cannot get information and you cannot get machines. Only an intelligent author does that. Only an intelligent engineer produces a machine. And when we see the likes of it in biology, it vastly outpaces anything in human technology. Therefore, its origin was both supernatural, beyond what any natural process of time, chance, and natural laws, chemistry, and physics can accomplish, it's also superhuman, beyond what the best human technology can produce. It is, by definition, a miracle. Now then, here's some more of those that were uh, drawn by Ernst Teckel, and these are so popular that they're actually making jewelry copying the design that we see in the radiolaria. And uh, here we have a radiolarian queen, it's used in artwork, uh, little conversation pieces are made out of it, you know, copying God's design because it's so beautiful. Here we have a chalice and decanters copying the radiolarian design. An artist copied this one, made it in uh, uh, aluminum alloy, he said it's so beautiful I couldn't improve on it, so I'll just copy it. And they've done that with wrought iron also. The artists say, you know, I can't improve on this, but I would like to copy it. This one was used as the inspiration for a pavilion in the 1900 Paris Exposition, World Exposition. They later changed that to World's Fair, but again, inspired by the beauty and the architecture that God invented first. And this one was so beautiful, the artist said, I'm just going to copy it in colored bronze and leave it the way it is. I cannot improve on the beauty and the symmetry of it. And they put it on shirts nowadays, and perhaps the purest form of appreciating this is like I have back under the microscope there, where they arrange the diatoms and the radiolaria on the micro microscopic slide and arrange them into patterns. You know, we have this appreciation of beauty because we're made in the image of God, and this aesthetic appeal that we see in the diatoms, we want to kind of add to that and make it even more wonderful. So we put these individual little jewels, individual little works of art into further patterns and mosaics that look even more beautiful because we love to experience beauty and symmetry and color. And we see that in the microscopic level because God invented it first and we simply copy it and manipulate it. Amazing indeed. Okay, so on the left we have again the diatoms, on the right the radiolaria, God invented glass first, clear glass first, and glass houses first, and glass works of art first. He's first in all those categories. Now here we have the Great Pyramid in Egypt, which they estimate prior to some of its decomposition that it was as much as 480 feet high. It was for many centuries the highest man-made structure in the world, and it wasn't until nearly the 20th century with the building of the Eiffel Tower in Paris uh, in 1889 that we finally built something uh, over twice as tall as the Great Pyramid. But when it comes to building tall structures, at least in how big the structure is compared to the body size of the builders who make it, man has not outdone one of God's creatures. One of God's creatures that are blind, they can't even see, yet they create, in proportion to their body size, uh, skyscrapers bigger than anything we have done. Now, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they had perfected a, a process for producing steel that was much more economical. And this opened up steel on the market so it could be used, and we started building big skyscrapers. In 1930, they completed what you see in the background there, the Chrysler Building. It was briefly the tallest building in the world. But in 1931, they completed the Empire State Building, which was even taller. And it actually remained the tallest building in the world for nearly 40 years but these are nothing compared to the size of what God has made with his little creatures called termites. 
Now, termites come in various sizes, but the average is only about a third of an inch. And when you compare their tiny size to how big these are, they're bigger in proportion to their body size than any of our skyscrapers are compared to our average size. In fact, uh, what we have done, like the Empire State Building, this is how it would appear to the termites. If you, uh, you know, compare the ratio of body size, it's not that impressive to them. They've built things much taller. And uh, they're very tough, too. They're made out of a simple composition of elephant dung, dirt, and the saliva of the termites, which again has those uh, almost biological glue-type proteins that make it very strong. It's about as strong as concrete. You have these big six-ton African elephants come up and rub their itching rears on them to scratch themselves, and it doesn't crumble, it doesn't break and fall apart. It can stand up to all those tons of weight. I mean, it's really amazing when you think of it. Now, here we have the current tallest skyscraper in the world, the Burj Khalifa in the United Arab Emirates in Dubai. Uh, does anybody know how tall this is? No, it's a little over half a mile tall. That's pretty tall, but it still doesn't beat what the termites have done. Uh, the tallest termite mounds in the world are found in Africa. Now you can see the uh, giraffe there. <laughs> Giraffes typically will get up to about 18 feet tall, so they're about the tallest. And these termite mounds get up to 25 feet tall. You compare that to the tiny little size of the blind termites that know how to build these things, uh, the Burj Khalifa wouldn't look very impressive next to it. <laughs> That's all it would be compared to their body size. So it doesn't mean that we can't build things taller. As scientists tell us steel is strong enough that if we wanted to, we could build a skyscraper well over a mile high, but nobody's done it yet, mainly for economic reasons. It would be very, very expensive. So until they want to you know, swallow uh, the bill and build something that big, the termites still hold the world record. Now, the termite mounds are not just huge uh, skyscraper edifices for no purpose. They actually have a very definite purpose. They're designed to build up where they get hit by the sunlight. The sunlight heats them up, and they have these inside passageways that are air ducts. And so when it, the termite mound is heated up by the sun, it becomes warm. The warm air rises, and it exits out of vents in the top of the termite mound. That suction then pulls through these passageways under the ground where it's cool, far enough under the ground that it's cool, cool air. So you have this flow, a form of air conditioning. Why is that? Because at the bottom of the termite mound there, they have uh, incubated a certain type of uh, fungus that they like to feed to their young, and the adult termites eat it too. But this fungus is very temperature sensitive. It only grows the best when it's kept at a constant temperature within one degree plus or minus the optimum temperature. These termites are not only blind, they have a built-in biological thermometer. They're able to build these things underground without seeing anything. Of course, it's dark anyway, so I guess it wouldn't matter. Uh, they cooperate with one another, and they open and close these passages as their biological thermometer tells them any little change in the temperature, even just one degree, they either open or close these passages to allow more or less air to come through and circulate to keep it at the constant temperature. In analyzing this, we found out that this is far more efficient of an air conditioning system than anything man ever invented. In fact, it has been copied. Uh, one case is this building in Zimbabwe, Africa, and another one in London, England. <coughs> now, both of these buildings look like they have a whole bunch of chimneys on top of them, but they're not chimneys, they're air vents. So as the building heats up in the sunlight, the warm air rises and vents out, and it pulls from underground chambers and passageways cool air. This has made their system 90% more efficient than our conventional air conditioning systems. Both of these were built back in the mid-1990s, and in the decades since, they have saved their owners literally millions of dollars in air conditioning fees, because God not only invented it first, as usual, he invents it better, more efficient, and, uh, you know, more efficient than anything we have anyway. Okay, so finally here, if I can get it, coil spring. What does the history book tell us? Man invented the coil spring in the 1700s. But later on we found out, oops, like so many things, we don't get the credit for inventing it. God invented it first. And he invented it at the nanometric scale, measured in nanometers, which is a billionth of a meter. It's that small and it's found in the inner ear. Now, the inner ear of mammals, and man especially, is a big quandary for the evolutionists. 
They claim that mammals evolved from reptiles, but all reptiles have a single ear bone called the columella. And it works fine, you know, reptiles survive fine with that type of ear. Uh, it's not able to give you the subtle nuances of music like we love to experience because making an image of God, we, we enjoy the beauty of music and the subtle nuances of tone and everything is something we can appreciate because we have a much more sophisticated ear than reptiles. But because they believe reptile ears evolved into mammal ears and ultimately into human ears, they have to explain how this single ear bone broke apart, turned into three articulated ear bones that are coordinated to work with one another and attached to the eardrum. So we have what's called the, the hammer, uh, the anvil, and the stirrup because of what they do and what they look like. Uh, technically, they're called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. These three were supposed to have been formed from part of the reptile's jawbone. They have multiple jawbones. One of the jawbones disarticulated, broke off, shrunk down, and turned into this beautiful articulated mechanism. There's absolutely no transitional fossils showing that at all. It's just a story. Furthermore, how are you going to eat very well when jaws, your jawbones are being detached? And how are you going to hear? Because until it's finished, you're stone cold deaf. Not being able to hear is not very good for survival. But there's no transitions. There's no way random mutations could orchestrate this thing. But even if it could happen, you're still stone cold deaf because the main seat of hearing in mammals and in humans, we are mammals by the technical definition, uh, is in the inner ear in this kind of curly section there on the right called the cochlea. It's kind of like a snail shell or something. Inside there, there is an amazing organ that does not exist at all in reptiles. It's called the organ of corti. It is the main seat of hearing in humans. It does not exist at all in mammals. And it's the most complex system in the entire inner ear. We'll give you a look at it here if I can get it up here. So inside that, you know, section there, we got kind of a cross section, and you can see the organ of corti there. It's a little bit small there, so we'll give you a close-up of it. So it has a bottom half, and it has this kind of arm that comes over the top of it. And connecting between that bottom half and the arm are little hairs, nanometric hairs, except they look like bundles of, you know, three hairs each. Each one of those bundles is uh, 18 and a half to 23,000 hairs. And when we look at them, it's, it's truly amazing the way God designed this. You have a short hair next to a long hair. And when vibration comes through the ear, it causes that long hair to wiggle with the vibration. And as it wiggles, it opens a trap door on the top of the short hair next to it. That trap door is so small that it's designed to allow the passage of a single subatomic particle called a proton. Protons are positively charged particles. So the more protons that go into the inner ear like that, it changes the electrical properties of your inner ear, which sends a message to your brain that is interpreted as sound or speech or music or just noise. You would not even be able to hear the words I'm speaking today if God hadn't invented at the nanometric scale the coil spring that attaches to the large hair and pulls open that little trap door, allowing a single proton every time it wiggles. Very high-pitched sounds cause that to wiggle 20,000 times a second. Yet these things can last for a lifetime. Some people in their 80s and 90s still have perfect hearing. God not only made the first coil spring, he made it at the nanometric scale and so resilient that it can last for a lifetime. God did it first. And if he didn't, we wouldn't even be able to experience the beauty of speech and music. God is the one who gets the glory. What do the evolutionists say about things like this? Well, Janine Benyus, she's an evolutionist biologist. She's really big on biomimicry. She says, we should copy the design in biology because nature is our creator. Well, you know, the Bible tells us that when people reject the true God, when they knew God, but they would not honor him as God, God turned them over to reprobate mind and they end up worshiping created things rather than the creator. Nothing new under the sun. These evolutionists worship nature, what God created, rather than he who is the creator. Nothing new at all under the sun. Well, what do the evolutionists say to these things? Francis Crick, a famous member of the Watson Crick team that first elucidated the double helical structure of DNA for which they got uh, the Nobel Prize back in the 50s, uh, he said biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. No matter what you see, no matter that it's more complex than anything we've ever made, 
We can't even make a single cell that can build itself, maintain itself, repair itself automatically, and reproduce itself, and keep doing that for thousands of years after it was made. We can't make any machine like that. It's beyond our technology. He says, doesn't matter. Whatever you see, it had to have evolved. They just closed their minds to the truth. Well, believe it or not, Francis Crick is today a creationist. How many of you knew that? Well, he came about it the hard way, kind of the devil's way. In 2006, he died. And when you die, you meet your maker. And he is now like the demons who know that there is but one true God. But they tremble, knowing that they face judgment because they have rebelled against him. They refuse to have a love and righteous relationship with him. And this man is now a creationist. I tell people, you ought to become a creationist before you die. It turns out better in the end. We're all going to be creationists in the end, whether you like it or not. Just like the devil is a creationist. So God says that it's so obvious that the design he has put in the world cannot be explained. Information, machines, which we know is the basis of modern biology today, cannot be explained by anything but intelligent design and intervention. And it's all over the world, not just the complexity and technology of engineering, but also the aestheticism, the beauty that does not have to be there for survival, but is there because it reflects the beautiful nature of our God, his appreciation of beauty, he puts it in the creation so we can appreciate it as well. So as Paul wrote nearly 2,000 years ago, ever since the creation of the world, his, meaning God's invisible nature and attributes, that is his eternal power and divinity, have been made intelligible and clearly discernible in and through the things that have been made. His handiworks, today we've looked at just some of his marvelous handiworks, and indeed it is true that they are without excuse, altogether, without any defense or justification. Well, I do have this available also on DVD, the same presentation I did today. I do invite you to take a look in the microscope at the diatoms before you leave. And Pastor, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Wow. Well, you know, uh, this is ma as amazing as that, as that is, you know, the Bible tells us that um, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so what's so cool, that Greek word poema means we are a poem in the, in the making or the writing. So not, on, not only are we already made, ready for heaven, but we're being made in such a way that we would glorify him. And so it's pretty amazing. So can we all stand together? We'll, we'll close with a, a song, but I wanna close in prayer and don't forget to look through the microscope because it's amazing. So Lord, we wanna thank you for blessing us with this encouraging message. And we just ask that we would continue to grow in our faith and stand bold for you in a world that rejects you. And so we want to thank you for that our eyes are open to the truth and the confidence that we can have living this life, looking forward to eternal life. And so thank you for that. And um, we just want to lift up the remainder of this day. I pray for all those that are here. I ask God that they would just uh, be encouraged, be comforted, and uh, strengthened by your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And be sure to visit the back table.